<clears throat> well, I guess. Uh, So I guess uh, the one thing I wanted to say is I wanted to speak about our friend uh, Katie Roberts. But in, in, in thinking of that, I wanted to say, well, we're being interviewed about the bluffs and its success and whatnot. And uh, it, it, it always uh, comes up in my mind that I don't want to come across as like taking credit on due credit. I want to stress that the community and so many, you know, is thank God that he let this happen, you know. Uh, that's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it is there's so many people who, whose, uh, you know, hearts were in this all along and they were not maybe able to express it, but they were there and, and, and I mean, express it, I mean, being vocal in front of a city council. But they were there as a force of, you know, what's right and what's needed for this community. So the, the credit goes to the whole community. But now back to uh, Katie. One thing that I remember that she kept bringing up was the overall vision of this town related to its open space and how rich it is, you know, the, the having the marsh, the bluffs, the channel with the islands beyond, and the back country. And, uh, you know, now we get to almost celebrate that, it, in fact, the back country is available to us now through the Franklin Trail. And that's another thing where Ted was very involved in uh, making that a successful campaign. Um, anyway, I guess I just wanted to, in a way, thank the whole community for you know, um, making this happen. Nice. This, yeah. Hold on, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> Katie Roberts also brought th the idea constantly to the front that the, the, the Bluffs is a, a wonderful outdoor classroom, and uh, she reminded Arturo and I and others continually about the importance of of the geography of open space. Um, there's a wonderful book she gave me called The Geography of Open Space about the importance of that in, in this digital age where kids no longer climb trees and, and stick sticks and gopher holes. Uh, Katie headed up this effort every year and it, and it used to be on Earth Day. We've now moved it to the fall, but we, we try to get every third grader we can from Carpinteria out to the bluffs for a day of learning about the bluffs, learning about, uh, or we teach them about the seals. Um, sometimes we do haikus out there, uh, teach them a little chumash lore, uh, turn it into a wonderful outdoor classroom. You know, the birds that are out there, um, lessons in ecology. I've never had a bad experience out of the bluffs with, uh, with classrooms, uh, with visiting students. Um, John Iwerks, one of the Oak Group painters, takes adult ed classes out there. It, it is a wonderful outdoor classroom. And I, I wanted to shift here and talk, and talk about, um, hoping you're going to be editing this. Uh, in, in, our, in our campaign to save the bluffs, when it became a public acquisition effort, we, we had over 3,000 donors, a huge, huge effort. And uh, I echo Arturo's sentiments that um, we, you know, we, we helped that. I mean, I personally helped spearhead this effort, but we couldn't have done it with, uh, without all of that help. And uh, people like Jack Baker, who, who gave us our first major believe, well, Johnny Brown, who gave us the, the really very first uh, little grant, but then Jack ba Baker gave us a sizable grant through the Wallace Foundation, but we didn't have a willing seller, so he was very nervous for a couple of years. And it's one reason we honor him out at the, at the bluffs. But the person that, if, you, if I were to take one name, it would be Lois Seidenberg, who, who founded the CBA and who remained doggedly in pursuit of saving the bluffs for years and years and years. She passed away in the early 90s, but I remember having a, a phone conversation with her. She no longer could come to hearings, but she saw our presentation on television 
when we uh, rebutted uh, the Barry Burkus uh, presentation of what a development at the Bluffs would look like, and we presented an alternate version that was actually, I think, more professional because we used all local images uh, that it just it came across as a stronger presentation. And the conversation I had with Lois later that week, I think she knew we were going to be successful. It was really gratifying looking back to know that, to have that conversation with her because she passed away, you know, a short time later. But she felt, and, she, and that night she expressed, you know, feeling good about the bluffs might be saved someday. Do you still have that presentation? Um, well, it's back in the slideshow era, so it was put together with, no, there were a number of people, Kathleen Lord and uh, Turo. Would some of those images be appropriate in this? Oh, oh yeah. You know, what I did is I, w I went around, well, we, a lot of people had input on this, and Kathleen Lord drew up a, a plan. I, um, I went around to a, b a bunch of parks in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County that, that, Ojai. that yeah. and Ojai that looked could look like the bluffs to, to present different aspects of whether it's a playing field or a trail. So we had these images that, uh, of what, the, of what uh, a fleshed out, more formal, back then we were proposing as a compromise a more formal park. Um, I'm glad we ended up with what we have, which is four-fifths of the, of the bluffs property is nature preserve and, and one-fifth is, is the Biola playing fields. Yeah, could, could you describe the bluffs now, what's there, what's there? Uh, Yeah, and maybe... Well, the bluffs, when, when we took over the bluffs, it, it, it had been cultivated for a number of years, so um, it, it's kind of changed a little bit 10, 15 years later than what it looked like when we, when we acquired the property. But there's, a, there's coastal sage out there, there's, there's some wet... Dick Weinberg came up with some oh, okay. actual. I can do a okay. better justice on this, but the Carpentry Bluffs Nature Preserve. Are you? Are we running? Yeah. The Carpentry Bluffs Nature Preserve uh, consists of wild grasslands, coastal sage, uh, some tamarisk windrows that are carry over from the old agricultural days, and also some eucalyptus windrows. Now, some people might think it's funny that we didn't acquire the property and then cut down the eucalyptus, but it's, it's a testament to the visual artists, including myself and, and the Oak Group, largely the Oak Group and Arturo's pushing, that the eucalyptus was a really a strong visual asset that had been, that really resonated with the artists that used the bluffs, not only for their own open space uses, but as a subject of, of their art. So we, 
preserved as, uh, two of the major windrows out there of eucalyptus, uh, along with the coastal sage. Uh, uh, about a fifth of the property is active recreation, uh, viola fields, uh, which we put in uh, with some restrictions to night lighting and sound. But I, I think we came up with a plan that is really within keeping of the majority of people that have been using the bluffs for years and years. Well, I, just, just to say that it is very, very much used. Uh, um, I go painting out there and I see people using it in the regular walks. I mean, consistently the same people have a route that they go, they take the dogs, enjoy, there's people flying airplanes there on the fields, um, you know, painters, you run into them all the time, it's just too many painters. <laughs> well, did you ever run out of things to paint? No, I haven't and I don't think I could. Um, there is a life force there, you know, I mean, it's always changing, it's always interesting. Um, you have the mountains that you can see from there, you have the ocean that you can see from there. There's 50 plus acres is a lot of land and um, it uh, I keep speaking of soul but like 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 faces and like like people it has different moods they have different different uh, feelings and of course the light of day plane it, you, you couldn't unless you were a very insensitive person you know or, or you were easily bored or something. I, 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 uh, I must say that I, maybe this is just me. I have friends who just the thought of, oh, you want to go paint it at the bluffs is like they've done it. Or, you know, so it might be just an individual thing, but I cannot conceive of somebody not being able to see something new each day there. So, uh, and, you know, it's not like you can, uh, show me two paintings that are like th the same, it's like you're doing the same thing. But that's because my approach is of being there and seeing what's happening there. And it's always different. Yeah, Arturo has been our unofficial spiritual guru for the bluffs, but he's absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm amazed even now, 20 years later, how many people write us to, to see if they can have a wedding out there or to have a memorial out there. Uh, I've been to a memorial out there, participated in a memorial. I've, we've had birthday parties out there. Arturo is a true citizen of the Bluffs because oh, yeah. he, he got his citizenship there. Um, and, you know, people will go out there if, to celebrate a high point in their life or a low point in their life. And so it really has become a, a very meaningful place for many people in this community for a host of reasons. Yeah. Uh, tell us about you getting your citizenship out there. Well, I was telling Ted about one meeting that I went to at the, at the city council uh, we were talking about the bluffs and, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier about the local terrorists, I was getting a lot of heat for being so outspoken about the bluffs. And uh, somebody was uh, complaining that why would I speak so much and why would I be, the given, be given the opportunity to speak so much when I wasn't even a citizen and I could not even vote. And what? I could not vote, ultimately, I, I, you know. I mean, I was a legal resident, but I was not a citizen at the time. So I said that um, I can do something about that, and I did. I, I uh, applied for citizenship, and um, I was allowed. And Dick Weinberg had a friend who was a uh, federal judge. And he, along, and, and, and this federal uh, judge, judge Davis, he was also uh, an art collector, a friend of Ellen Easton, my um, art dealer. And uh, amongst the, them, they came up with the idea of actually doing 
the ceremony of citizenship at the bluffs, and you were there, you taped it, and we had a... Did you have the tape of it still? Actually, yeah, uh -huh. somewhere. Um, so we had a, a fairly large group of local citizens, including uh, Michael Ledbetter took a keyboard out there, uh, 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 Jim Stein put a huge flag up there. Uh, that must have been when I was in Chicago. This was in 96. This oh, 96. Was, this, uh, I, was yeah, I was in Georgia, the jungle. 96, yeah. in Georgia, the jungle. Georgia, the jungle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I was in... I was working on Georgia the Jungle, so I, have, I was on a jungle while. <laughs> I, have, I have a painting that uh, Thomas Van Stein did of the occasion. He painted a group of people and the flag. And it's, uh, it happened right there where the viola fields are now. And uh, it was a huge honor to, uh, really moving for me to become a citizen right there in a place that I love. So. It was one of the great things. Could you mention again how uh, Dick Weinberg made models during the was it during the visioning process? Or yeah, I, I no, it, it was it, it was the uh, it, he he did that for the nineteen that 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 meet, hearing in nineteen ninety six when Gary Nielsen threw the swing boat. Uh, I remember that in particular, but because you probably you may want to interview Dick Weinberg, so yeah. Yeah. Well, my my feeling, I, I, I could be wrong, <laughs> uh, was that he did in fact make make three dimensional the proposals that uh, that were being put up at the time, and I think that was Burgess's proposal, but I could be wrong. But I just remember that. I mean, there's nothing like uh, actually. Um, putting a uh, strong visual there. And his was not only visual, it was almost, I mean, it was three-dimensional. And uh, just told the story. Uh, and was he, the story that it was uh, a, more, uh, a bigger than one? Yeah, more dense, more intense, not pleasing. And uh, he, he he had a great manner about him, a great charisma, and you know, just kind of like, oh shocks, I don't know anything, but here, <laughs> and and he just presented well. He was, I mean, uh, yeah, charismatic about it. It was fun and and very uh, um, credible, you know. He's a very and good I, guy. I kind of watched his city yeah, for sure, and. You know, the same with Donna earlier. I, I have the honor of having asked her to please run for city council. At least she credits me for that. She says, oh, what you did. But um, earlier, I mean, she was just one of concerned citizen offering testimony about saving the bluffs. And uh, pretty much that issue, maybe she was also speaking about other issues, but I think it was mostly about the bluffs. And people responded. She's just a very smart, very res uh, respectful, respected uh, lady, lots of charisma, you know. So it's like these people who now we kind of take for granted that, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're important and they're ex-majors, ma mayors and this and that. Well, they were regular old housewife citizens at the time offering just from the hard testimony. Yeah, I want to add something to that. Sure. I think one reason that we have a, a, a very good and, and strong, conscientious city council is, for the most part, they are reluctant leaders. And many of them ran for office because others asked them to step up to the plate. They're not in it for themselves or to. To, to use it as a stage to uh, thump their chest and let people know how good they are. You know, it, it's, it, it's the reluctant leader that comes forward. And like Donna Jordan, I remember when she stepped forward uh, with a, a neighborhood problem and, and then contacted the CVA, the Carpenter Valley Association, and got more and more involved. 
Um, I remember when uh, Brad Stein was concerned about sidewalks and curbs in his neighborhood and, and Measure M with, with his wife Carla and, and got more involved. And Mike Ledbetter got involved with Measure M. Uh, Al Clark, who was really getting other people to run for office and finally he was asked to run for office, but they're all, they're all reluctant leaders, and, and, but they become really good conscientious. Well, they always were conscientious, but that's, to me, your best kind of representative. Um, and I think it's a testament to, to, our, to our town. At the 50th anniversary, I think we're in good hands, uh, at least when it comes to the environment. I mean, may, I personally would like to see a more socially conscious city council, but that'll come in time. I don't want to open up a whole can of worms. Yeah, I don't know what you mean, but okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's a whole area. You don't, you don't want to get into that for the, this. As, as Lois would say, we don't want to go there. Want... No, we have two communities here. We have, a, we have a Latino community that is not represented at all right now in city council. <laughs> Santa Barbara's going through that. Well, but... In terms of the future, any things you'd like to see different? Do you want to mention that, Ted? I don't have to think on that one. Open yeah, that can of words. Went Arturo for office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, oh, I do have something actually. Are, are we, I've been running all this time. Well, I, I just assume you didn't strike that last part out. But actually, it's interesting that. Um, Um, <laughs> it's interesting that that Carpinteria has done has has taken some stands recently. Um, like our local Albertson store was one of two national grocery stores that banned uh, paper bags and plastic bags uh, in the, in the country. And then uh, this our local city council uh, initiated a ban, adopted a ban on that, as well as uh, making us a, a, a no smoking town. Um, and we did that before Santa Barbara. Uh, so in, in, in certain areas, we have really you know, pushed the envelope. Um, when, um, when the bluffs thing happened, it was kind of divisive between the Chamber of Commerce folks and others. And there have been different times when there's been some divisiveness. Also, the greenhouse issues and the wire mascot issue. Uh, and any thoughts about any of that? Yeah, I, I, I sort of addressed that earlier about, uh, you know, the, uh, the bluffs was certainly divisive. But, you know, at the end, um, it, it's, not, it's not like the chamber says, Damn, you know, I wish we hadn't saved, that these people had not saved the bluffs. I think they embrace the bluffs now as something good for the town. And uh, how can they not? I mean, and it, it's certainly an asset for visitors and for everybody. Um, as far as, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that It, it, it's it's unfortunate that 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 exists, but it's it's just real, and I don't know if it's just it's not only here; it's everywhere. You know that um, uh, the chamber needs to be uh, more uh, right wing, pro development, pro business. Of course, they have to be. Um, I, I I get that, but. Um, I wish that they, you know, in, in, in strictly local issues and that they could see uh, you know, past the bottom line or past profits or, you know, and, and, and see what, uh, what's, what's really ultimately good for the town. You know, and I, I don't think that that's always there. I could be wrong, but uh, it has showed up in different ways where 
you know, it, it's, it's just unfortunate. Ted was mentioning uh, that time when we had a uh, presentation of uh, 5,000 plus little toy cars behind the planning commission. It was a, there was a picture in the paper actually. It was a, it was a stage in the, in, the, in the school and the whole stage was full of these cars. And obviously, you know, it was gonna be a huge impact. We were making that visual. And so the, at the time, the representative of the Chamber of Commerce got up and says, well, what I see is a mosaic of, uh, what, of activity. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of nice, <laughs> you know? And so that kind of thing is like, you know, it, it's best if you just kind of go, well, okay, that was a strong presentation. I better keep my peace, you know? It's not like coming out like, you know, whatever they say, I'm gonna say the opposite. So yeah, it's just divisive. I, I can comment on divisive. I think the word divisive is used in different contexts. When, when we were in the late 80s, uh, and especially the late 80s before the election, and just after the election of Ledbetter, Jordan, and Stein, the word divisive was only used by one side of, if there were sides to that issue, you have to understand that when we were speaking out about possibly saving the carbonary of bluffs, we had almost everyone against us that were in, in, in any kind of powerful position. We had the entire city council against us. We had the, the Carpentry Herald against us, the, the Santa Barbara News Press against us, the Chamber of Commerce against us, um, everyone that, that had access to communication other than the Santa Barbara Independent was against us, and they were the ones saying we were divisive. I think they're using that as, a, as rhetoric because we were bringing up something they didn't want to hear. But be, and that's where our humor came in, uh, really reached a lot of people because they saw that we were not, you know, had we been abrasive and just constantly in their face about a lot of this stuff, we, we might not have been as successful at all. But we did look for creative solutions. We did keep our sense of humor. And we were all, this is a small town. People knew us. It, it used to be funny. People would say, I don't like the CVA. You know, they, they, they do this and they do that. But then you say, well, do you like this person on the CVA? Oh, yeah. Do you like this person on the CVA? Yeah. Do you, oh, yeah. Oh, that's a nice person. Oh, yeah, that's a nice person. But then, but put them together in an organization. I hate the CVA. <laughs> so that was one use of, of the word divisive that we just sort of, I think, shined on because we just, we just persevered and, and eventually found a creative solution. Now, when you take another issue like the mascot issue that is still unresolved, you can call that divisive. And, and in that case, I would say it's divisive because people are no longer talking to each other. But uh, there might be other words you might also apply to that besides divisive, because many schools have gone through that mascot issue. My family went to two colleges that were Indians, the Stanford Indians and the Dartmouth Indians. Neither of those schools have that as a mascot any longer because they moved into the 20th century and, and, and moved beyond it. And, and, and it did not take away at all from the heritage or the educational experience of those schools. Carpinteria has yet to deal with that. It's, it's, maybe it's a divisive as a word, to, but maybe it's just uh, because it remains a controversial issue and it's hard to move on from, from the history of, the, of that school. But eventually, I think they probably will, we or they will deal with that issue. Yeah, but I, I, I hope, I mean, we had nothing to do with the mascot one way or another. <laughs> that's, that's separate from the bluffs. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we're, not the right, we're not the ones to... And, and then I, I want to say, um, you know, when I run into Betty uh, Brown, the widow of Ralph Brown, she gives me a hug. Um, she's a great lady and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, 
friendly with Ralph Brown. They bought some of my paintings um, uh, before I came to, you know, to, to, to be so outspoken against the Bluffs development. And one time when I said something, uh, you know, I hurt his feelings and I truly apologized. And then one time when he, uh, he had some people clear some sage out there at the Bluffs, you know, I raised the issue before the council and they had a meeting about it. It's, he went into some protected ESH, uh, environmental sensitive habitat, and did something clearly that was wrong. He didn't realize it, but then he went there and he said, well, you know, they've been using my land all this time and, you know, I don't get any respect for that. And uh, fortunately, I had had the foresight. I wore a t-shirt that says, respect your elders, and I brought a painting to give to him at the council. And I said, Ralph, I brought this to give to you as thanks for all the times that I've been able to go paint over there. It was a moment of, you know, respect. And so that's been our attitude. We speak from the heart. What we truly believe is, you know, for the best of the community and without wishing to offend anybody. You know, it, it happens in the heat of passion. You, you can say some things and uh, then you apologize, <laughs> you know. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel, I mean, I, I, I don't feel that anybody has a huge animus for the stance that I've taken. Yeah, and, and speaking to the, the incumbents that I, that I helped put out of office in 1990, I have always said that I respected them for their years of service, and uh, I just disagreed with their, with their policies and thought there, was, there were other people that could be, bring the city to a different professional level, but um, I think many of us in that campaign had that attitude, and it goes back to Arturo talking about respect. Uh, I respected them for their public service. I just disagreed with them, but did so with respect, I believe. Um, and it has been fulfilling to see some of them, or maybe all of them, who uh, really f fought us on, on, on the bluffs to now realize what that was all about and, and to see them out there enjoying the bluffs. Um, it's very, been very gratifying. I, I think it's actually funny, you know, that, uh, um, you know, nowadays there's this thing called astroturfing where, you know, the, there's certain companies that uh, hire people to bring, you know, people to meetings that will have t-shirts of a certain color and they, they're going to be there and then they expect to be like the opposition of, you know, the people who are in the other side of the issue. And I felt that last time we were talking about, um, there was a uh, oil related issue at city council. And the regular people who go there to speak about the issue, you know, knowing what it's about, are there. And then these people from outside that come in and they, they're ready for something. And <laughs> you know, we're just placidly sitting there and knowing what to talk about and stuff. So it's almost like they have no, no pushback, you know? It's not, we're not gonna scream at them, and there is not, none of that. It's, you know, we, we just kinda let them do whatever they're doing there. They're just, their presence, but what does it mean? We're not there to fight anybody, we're just there to speak to the points, you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's, it's interesting that's, you know, a small town is like a different from, like an anonymous big city that, where you can get those passions. Of course you get passions here, but they're, you know, somehow they're channeled in a more pointed, effective way, you know, um, to the point. Do you yeah. know whether the council meeting was televised when you gave Ralph Brown a, a painting and whether you'd have the It came out in the paper, uh, they said, it, um, I think it was. I think it was. Would you be able to figure out the date of that? 
I mean, if you, uh, I, I've, ha I've Googled it sometimes and I, I see it. I, I could probably. Um, also, um, tell me about the canoe races. Were you, were you talking about that earlier? Or yeah. Were you talking about that? We both were. Yeah, this happened at the 25th anniversary uh, of the city. Um, what about it? We already, <laughs> we already. Well, I don't think we did it on camera. Did Are you on a two shot or a one shot there? Two shot. Well, the, the, you know, there was this parade uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary, and the CVA participated. Uh, it was a, a dry land boat race, and I think we did a canoe or a tour, I think, and maybe some of the other artists uh, decorated this canoe with some of the uh, artwork that Campbell Grant had drawn in his cave painting books, uh, Chumash images. Um, and in this race, it was Arturo, Christy and I, and I think we just had to carry this boat or something. And I had been a canoeist and kayaker in college. And I, so I was in the back of, uh, I suppose I asked to be in the back because I knew actually how to do a J-stroke even though we were on dry land. It didn't make any, any difference. But at the last minute, we decided we needed one more person. So I saw a friend of mine on the sidewalk and called him over. And that was uh, Terry Tw Twitchell. And, um, we didn't realize the significance. I think we actually placed if Terry we didn't. Eagle. Win. I mean, Did Terry you? Eagle, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I, so I, I looked over on the sidewalk, and I saw a friend of mine, uh, Terry Eagle, and uh, he came and joined us. And, and we didn't realize the significance of this until later. And, and I think we, we might have won the race, so we, we did really well in it. But uh, it would have been 10 years well, eight years later, when we actually, the, the night we were celebrating, it was probably New Year's Eve, we were celebrating uh, the successful a uh, acquisition of the Bluffs, and someone had brought this picture from the newspaper, and it showed us in this boat, and it was the people I just described. It turned out to be the, some of the key players in the acquisition effort, and, and Terry, who was the head of development at, at Kate School, was in that boat with us, and I was I was steering the boat, and I ended up like steering the campaign. So it was it, it was sort of this uh, strange omen from the past. Uh, and what was the event that was at? This was at the 25th anniversary celebration of the city, and they sponsored what what was it, Arturo? Some kind of uh, was it a day long thing of events or? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So what had happened was that. Uh, the Robitaille, uh, uh, was it Guy Robitaille? Yeah, he had uh, some connections with this uh, Navy uh, ship that was visiting. And so he had the uh, uh, sailors come over and do this event, like they, do, like they used to do in Semana Nautica in Santa Barbara. So this, for the 25th anniversary, they were here and they were competing in different stuff. They were competing in the canoes. But I don't, I don't even remember the sailors. That's funny. Yeah. And what was your canoe made of? Cardboard, but I think it had wheels, and I think we had paddles. Yeah, we did have paddles. I can't yeah. remember. And there was a parade. We, 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 we ran it, and, and we, we were playing our songs, which were, you know, this land is your land, and uh, along the parade route. We'll have to find that picture. It was funny. There's there's two development officers, a Thatcher and Kate. One's Terry Twitch and one's Terry Eagle. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like. <laughs> um, CBA. Yeah. So, what was Can you give me a once over of the, about the CBA? What, you may have done this already, but what has it done in the Carpentry Valley? Well, the Carpentry Valley Association was co founded back in 1964 by Lois Seidenberg and Campbell Grant a year before the city incorporated, and uh, patterned a little bit like the Citizens Planning Association in Santa Barbara. They, they really wanted to, to ensure that Carpinteria remain a small coastal beach town with, a, with a, its rural characteristics, its agricultural characteristics. Um, and they, they worked uh, doggedly over the years to ensure this in a number of, of of arenas, um, 
The bluffs was one of their big passions. Uh, and Arturo and I joined them you know, in, the, in the 80s. But um, they used to give out an annual architectural award um, to various developments. Uh, the, the Carpentry Lumber Yard got one one year. Um, they worked on screening the greenhouses when the greenhouses started to proliferate. Uh, I know Lo that was a passion for Lois, was making sure that they had screening from the roads so that you wouldn't just be seeing these glass walls. Um, a number of, of commercial and housing projects that were perceived as being out of scale of Carpinteria. I mean, there's a concern about urban sprawl and um, can you remember some of the issues? I mean, in the, in the late 80s, when we got involved, there were a number of, of projects going in, the, the, the tilt-ups down at the marsh. The, uh, uh, there was a small commercial shopping area along Via Real uh, uh, at the west end of the valley. Um, they, there was some uh, housing that went in, condo projects. Um, these all became a concern because uh, developers would, would be promised a, an easy passage of their, of their applications, and, and they would ask for as much as they could get. I mean, there was a, a funny story of, of a, when the Carpinteria Inn went in uh, down by Aliso School. The reason it has three floors is that the architects asked for three floors, figuring they would get two. And at that time, the city just approved three. And uh, the reason we knew, know this is one of our local, this is the benefits of being in a small town, one of our other local architects overheard these guys talking in amazement one time, just someplace where they were doing shop talk. He said, yeah, we never expected to get the third floor, but they gave it to us, so we, we built it. Yeah, so yeah, I have something to say to that. So I also overheard somebody. So the the, the developers uh, they were making a, a conceptual presentation, and I heard them say, "Well, we're just throwing it on the wall, seeing what what sticks." And so I addressed that. I said, "You know, if if we're just going to prove anything that gets." Uh, presented, I, I mentioned the quote, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And you know, I said some very unpleasant things stick and they smell too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is shit. Um, so that was the role of the CBA and uh, you know, these were citizens uh, not even getting paid for as little as the planning commission gets paid, but putting as much input, at, at least at the time when I was uh, you know, doing it, it's a lot of work to go to meetings, to, to know the packet, to be able to speak to stuff and to, uh, uh, you know, to, to try and make a difference. And, and all you have, as I mentioned before, is the zoning laws and what's already been in place by a certain vision. And uh, it's funny, it's amazing how much how many times people just want to go push past the envelope that they have. And um, so the idea of a watchdog organization is to keep, keep the process, you know, keep, keep everybody honest, both the developers and the, and the city. And that's what I was saying before about the bottom line. And I forgot that you mentioned the divisive nature of the, uh, the greenhouse issue. Uh, if, if you now, if you go up the, the trail, um, Franklin Trail, you'll see that there's quite an impact, of a, a, a kind of a lake of uh, greenhouses that you see from up there. And that's the good part. It was going to be worse because they were trying to move the percentage of coverage, you know, out and out. And, you know, it, it was contentious. It was, the CVA had to work hard to say, okay, enough is enough and, and think of the impact that you're having. And I remember clearly one, one comment that I 
brought up, they were saying, well, you know, you're just, you keep arguing about this, the aesthetics of things, you know, it's like, this is a business, this is, you know, like, uh, it's a multi-million dollar business, and, you know, we, we can't just be stopped by that. And so I said, you know, aesthetics are so important that without the idea of aesthetics, your whole industry would not be necessary. To, to have flowers, you know, why would people want to have flowers if aesthetics wasn't paramount, you know? So that's the point. And, and see, the chamber would not take the time to go up there and make that point because the bottom line is affected. But it's, you know, our quality of life matters here. So aesthetics is a big part. Thank you, Larry, for catching us this Saturday morning. Um, yeah, I, went, I, I feel proud of, of so much of the work we've done. We've had some, some things we've been unsuccessful at, but uh, the Bluffs is a good example of uh, community involvement, uh, getting people to run for office, uh, on a certain platform, and w one thing I left out earlier, but the, the other aspect that was so fulfilling in 1998 and 2000, uh, 2001, when we turned the, the bluffs over to the city for permanent stewardship, uh, national, the national political scene was very cynical, uh, much as it is today. Congress was gridlocked over Monica Lewinsky and, and Clinton. Um, and so here at the local level, we were turning over 51 acres of open space for permanent stewardship to a city council we had elected partly on that premise. And it led me to believe that it's, it's the little towns that are going to lead us out of these problems, not, not our congresses. And um, it, was a, it was a very fulfilling moment for many of us in Carpinteria and perhaps why we've gone on to inspire other communities to keep on keeping on and, and pursue their, their dreams and keep their towns the way they want to keep them. Well, good job, John. And then I should go. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bullshit. <laughs> I hope that doesn't come out. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs>